Aliyah, welcome to the Undraped Artist Podcast. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's great to be here. Oh my gosh, you have no idea how unbelievably excited I am to have you on the podcast. When I started this podcast, you were one of the main artists that I wanted to get on. So, oh, wow. Well, I'm glad that I, I'm glad you reached out. I'm glad I said yes. Yeah, <laughs> so great. am I. So am I. I'm so excited. I'm such a huge fan. I've been following you ever since you won the BP award way back. Was that wow. like in 2012 or something? Yeah. 10 years. It's yeah. wild that it's been 10 years. Yeah. That was the very beginning of my career. So you've, you've seen the whole thing. I've seen the <laughs> whole amazing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> I was so floored when you kind of arrived on the scene back in 2012. I was just like, who is this person? doing these incredible <laughs> figures just out of nowhere. And you came out of nowhere and won that award and just kind of, I think you blew a lot of minds that year. So yeah, well, this is, you. this is a huge, huge honor to have you on the show. So, well, first what I want to do is I want to kind of, you said that's the beginning of your career, but what led up to that? Give, can you give us a little bit of background on how you started okay. and how you ended up being an artist? So that's the beginning of my career in terms of Pub publicly, really, right? Of course, uh, as I'm sure every artist listening, or most of us have been painting or drawing since we were kids, like we're always drawing, right? Um, or making something and I just didn't stop making anything. Um, I started painting with oils when I was about 15 or 16. Um, which is really lucky. I'm very lucky that I had that. My mom, my mom is an artist as well. And she taught me as much as she could and taught me a lot. And then I wanted to learn oils and I wanted to learn more realism. And, and so she found this amazing local painter, Pete Jordan, landscape painter and um, on Whidbey Island. And he uh, let me come to the studio and paint every week. So that was an incredible beginning. Um, so that's when I was about 16 or so. Um, and then I went to Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle, here where I am now. And uh, that completely blew my mind open because, you know, it's a it's a it's an art school, but it has so many different mediums. And I was really just into realism and painting and so and drawing. And so there I did sculpture and video art. I was really into video. And, and um, of course, I also did painting and it just completely blew my mind open to what art could be, which was a really incredible experience. And then my junior year of college, I did a study abroad at the Glasgow School of Art because Jenny Savile went there. She's incredible. And that just really honed me back into painting in a way that I hadn't had for a couple of years. Um, and I just painted so much there and really realized that is really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And so I came back, graduated Cornish and um, ended up moving to the New York Academy of Art about two years later. Uh, or moving to New York to go to the New York Academy of Art. It's funny, I said I moved there. I basically moved yeah, to you that basically school. basically lived there. <laughs> <laughs> I moved two days before school started and I was there seven days a week. Yeah. Um, and that's, so this is in 2010 when I, when I moved to New York and went to grad school. And uh, that obviously helped me so much going there and really being in the school where everyone was doing realism, everyone was painting, um, uh, you know, an expansive form of realism, let's say, uh, figurative, but not always realist in terms of, you know, hyper real at all. But it was just so incredible to be in a community of artists who were thinking in the same ways that I was thinking and to be in New York City and to just get to paint every day. It was absolutely incredible. And um, that's where the Auntie's Project started. It was actually the Auntie's Project is the work that kind of got my career started. And it it was my thesis project. And um, that was leading up to 2012 <laughs> and then I graduated, um, but a couple months before I graduated, I decided that I would just send this painting off to London to see if it could get into the BP portrait award, kind of on a whim. Um, and then it got in and I remember finding out when I was like in anatomy class on a break and I got an email, <laughs> I was like, wait, what, what just happened? <laughs> this is incredible. And then uh, I graduated and then I went off to, to London for the show and, and um, found out that I'd won and just my mind complete, I mean, it was it completely blew, blew my own mind that this happened and um, blew my whole world open. And it was really incredible and really intense. And that is where 
you found me yeah, at that point. That's right. <laughs> and many, many, many other people found you at that point. So how did that help your career really? Was it a big deal? Cause I mean, mm -hmm. I won awards before nothing like the BP award and it's always, you always have this feeling like, oh, maybe this will be the thing that launches my career. And for yeah. me personally, it's been this incremental growth. It hasn't been just one thing, but has, is that different, a different situation with the BP award? Yeah. I mean, I think the BP, the BP award was so public. Um, you know, it's all, it's in newspapers all over the UK. Um, I didn't really know how, how big of a deal it actually was to be totally honest. Um, I mean, I knew that it was a big award, but having not grown up in the UK or lived in the UK, I didn't realize how it was just in all the newspapers and everywhere. So I think, I think it really helped just because it was so public. Uh, the other thing that helped is that Flowers Gallery, um, that, you know, they're from London. They also have a gallery in New York and now in Hong Kong. Um, they, they picked me up then. Like I started showing with them January after I won the BP Portrait Award, but I had met them before I won the BP Portrait Award at the New York Academy of Art. So I'd mm. sort of begun a connection. So it wasn't just the BP Portrait Award. It was like a lot of, it was getting a, getting to show with a really good gallery right out of school. Um, I also got the, the third year fellowship at the New York Academy. Um, and Elizabeth Greenchill's award. I sound very much like I'm bragging here. It was, no, I'm asking it was just you. Like yeah. all the stars yeah. were, were aligning and everything happened right then. So I think it's a combination of just like everything happening at once um, that really helped my career in that way. Um, and maybe it was just the type of work I was making at the right time. I mean, there's, there's so much that's just timing and luck. Um, and I think it's all of those things that kind of did it. Um, and then just working really hard. Yeah. Well, you're oh, being Lord. way yeah. too humble because I mean, of course there's always a little bit of luck and success. I mean, you have to be in the right place at the right time. If you painted what you painted in the forties, it might not have been successful, but, <laughs> but I mean, you are doing what you do as good or better than anybody. And that that's Thanks. obviously helped to propel you forward. I mean, it's unbelievable what you've accomplished. And the other thing is you mentioned hard work. I noticed as I was looking through your website, and we'll look at your website in a little bit. Yeah, um, I don't know how much you know about my work, but I'm a figurative painter as well. And I don't, I don't understand how you paint so fast. You yeah. produce so much work. Yeah, well, I paint all the time, um, and especially when I was in grad school. I mean, it was like, yeah. I didn't have weekends then. Now I take weekends. Um, <laughs> which is nice. Um, yeah, I paint, I paint fast in some ways. Some people think I paint really slowly. Some people I think I paint fast. Um, I think I paint fairly fast, although some paintings have taken like nine months to make, but I'm making other ones along with that. Um, so the, the way that I, the technique, the way that I paint, it is very hyper real when you look at it, but the process isn't so much if that makes sense we can get into more of this later but um i'm using very small brushes but i'm working in a very very fast way so my hand is like d working like this and i'm trying to just throw all my energy at the painting and i'm thinking about the whole thing as well as i'm thinking about the details but i'm i'm never going in there and describing in an illustration sort of way so when I'm painting wrinkles, I'm not going in there and spending a whole day on one wrinkle. I'm going to get the whole face in and that wrinkle is going to happen or all the wrinkles are going to happen through the, the way that I'm using the brush. Like I'm actually, I'm really allowing the brush to do a lot of work for me. I'm allowing kind of accidents to do a lot of work for me. I'm really a big proponent of, of, um, of accidents and yeah. of being what actually brings the life into a painting, especially a hyper real painting. Yeah. Um, a really allowing those like the brush to do a lot of the work. Um, how can a brush mark create the texture of skin instead of me going in and describing the texture of skin? So how can I sort of become, become the thing instead of describing the thing? Um, I think that might be why I paint fast. Um, I also recently learned as a 36 year old that I have ADHD, which might also, I think I just put that like really intense energy into painting. And so I can just get it done really fast because I'm very focused when I'm interested in something. And I harness that very speedy energy and throw that into the painting. And 
So they're fast and they feel more like like alive. They might not be very precise if you looked at the photo, but but they feel alive. So I'm impatient actually, and I'm also patient with that impatience. So I kind of try to harness the impatience that my that I naturally have. Yeah. And throw that work. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I can relate a little bit. I've often wondered if I was ADHD. I wonder if a lot of artists are ADD, frankly. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's quite possible because we can intensely focus yeah. on something we're interested in and think really creatively where we can really think outside the box. It's a pretty, it's a pretty cool thing to learn about. It is. So do you ever get to a point? Well, first of all, how long do you paint? How many hours a week do you get in painting? Um, I mean, on a good week, it's 40 hours a week. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm in the studio. I'm flexible with my hours, but working hours, nine to five, um, Monday through Friday. Um, if I can, there's things that come up in life that, right. that I, you know, have to adjust for, but like yeah, annoying as much podcasters, as I try to be is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually enjoy talking about art because I'm just alone in here painting all the time, which I absolutely love. But it is really nice to uh, be challenged to put all these things into words yeah. and to, you know, talk about painting. I, I do miss that from living in New York and being in grad school and just being in uh, in more of a community, um, having conversations about about painting and why we do it and yeah. challenges. Oh and yeah, I love it. Joy. I actually teach for that reason. I can't. I can't be alone in the studio. I freaking lose my mm. mind after a while. <laughs> I don't know how you do yeah. it, honestly. I love it. I, I, yeah, I really, I love it. I mean, I have audiobooks and music usually, right? And podcasts, um, but usually audiobooks because they can keep me going for a long, a longer time. Right. Um, do you ever yeah. lose focus? I mean, do you ever feel like, oh man, this painting is just not interesting to me anymore, and just have to drag yourself to the studio? I never have to drag myself to the studio, but I do have to just force myself to sit down and work. Um, yeah. I love being in the studio because I love having my own little space. Yeah. I, I really love a lot. Um, but I, you know, there's times in paintings, especially with like the more realist paintings that they're just, even though I love painting this way and love painting realistically, um, my work has changed a lot recently, but, um, it takes like there are times when it's like this is really just I need to sit down and do this. This is my job. I'm I'm working, and so yeah, it's harder. It's definitely harder. But a uh, good cup of coffee, good audiobook, good music, just focus. Um, and I usually, when I come to the studio, I will look at the painting and and feel what is most exciting for me, and then dive into that area. My paintings are really large, so there's different areas that I'm working on, and um, if you know, I'm, I'm trying to make myself interested in it. And yeah. I usually am. And when I'm not, well, it's, it's my job. Like how lucky am I that I get to do this right. as my job? So, yeah. so you mentioned earlier that mom, your mom was an artist. Was she a professional artist? Yeah, she still is. Um, she, a very different kind of artist. She, um, uh, it's called touch drawing. And essentially she, it's this way of drawing with your hands over really? paper that is on a surface, an inked surface, and then it comes up on the other side. It's kind of like a printmaking, but not really. And it's very intuitive. Um, and she's drawn all over the world and at conferences with like the Dalai Lama and, and it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's, she's, she's, she's made an artistic path for her that is very unique and unlike anything else. And she teaches and workshops and um, sells books and cards and, and like a, a, a deck of cards. Um, there, yeah, she's she's made a completely different world in art for herself. She went to Cooper Union in New York so she, in the yeah. 70s, which as a woman is pretty was pretty challenging. Um, wasn't very welcoming <laughs> to, to women, but uh, she has. She, yeah, she still does it. She's amazing. Wow. So you guys are like the Wyess or the Peel family or something. Just two generations of amazing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I'm very, I feel really fortunate that I have an artist as a mom and my dad is an architect and very, very visual and creative. And so having parents that are creative, I got to see that that was a possibility and I got the support, of course. Yeah. 
you know, that a lot of people grow up without knowing that you can actually be an artist when you grow up. And I, that was like all I saw. And there were times when I didn't want to do it. I remember thinking, I don't, I don't want to do that. That looks like, that looks like hard work. You're always working, yeah. <laughs> but also, also, wow. Like you get to do what you love. Like my parents aren't retiring because what, why retire from what, from doing what you love? Mm -hmm. Um, they should probably slow down a little bit, but <laughs> they love what they do. So. Um, having, yeah, having that as an example, uh, for what is possible, I, I, that has helped me in my career as well. Just having that support from a very young age. Did you feel confident from a young age that you could do this, that you could support yourself as a painter? Or did you just feel like I'm going to be an artist and I make what I make, I survive how I survive? A little bit of both. Really? Um, I was pretty blindly optimistic uh, that it would work out. And what I mean by that is I was, I, I remember moving to New York and going to grad school and being like, I'm just going to paint what I want to paint. I'm not going to pay attention to what sells because I have this incredible two years. If I need to be the, be a barista the rest of my life, as long as I can paint, that's great. Um, so, but, but then I also just, I don't know. I was just blindly optimistic. I was like, I'm, I'm just going to do it. I'm just, just going to do it. Cause I have to, cause there's nothing else that I can do or want to do. I mean, I made a good cup of coffee, but <laughs> like, yeah. I, so I find that I'll hard to believe a... that you couldn't have done something else. Is that, I mean, do you really mean that? Is there really nothing um, else that you could have done? Well, I'm sure I could have, but right. I mean, since I was, uh, it, it, my earliest memories have been like, oh, I'm, I'm, this is what I do. I'm, I'm an artist. Right. And I think, um, that's been great and also hard to think that I, I mean, to, to have any other life, um, not that I want another life, but I, I kind of grew up having this identity that I was good at making things look real. Like I was mm. good at realism, even though, you know, looking at my kid drawings, they're not that great, but uh, you know, for, for a kid, I, I sort of built my identity around that. And so in my recent work that we'll get to at some point, I'm sure um, I've been breaking completely away from that, like breaking out of that identity of being a realist painter and expanding into something else. And that has been difficult because I've built my identity on being someone who's good at making things look real. And um, I don't know, I, I, just, I just kind of knew that it was, what I had to do, blind optimism. That's really the only way I can describe it. Okay, so I wanna figure out how to transition to your art then. It's a little bit early, but I think we'll get back into more personal stuff later. Um, so let's talk about that. You, so yeah, here, is, here is, I believe this is 2012. Yeah, this is my thesis project. We're looking okay. at my grad school project. Okay, so, uh, and then uh, I just want to move, I'm just gonna just to make the point to the viewers that are watching this, I'm just gonna move directly to 2000, 2020, 2021, mm. which is freaking mind blowing, the change. <laughs> it is yeah, mind blowing. But different. you know what hit me when you started doing this? Cause as I said, I've been following you since you started. Um, I didn't think I could like your work more. And then you started doing this and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. What, oh, wow. how in the world did you get, did your work get more interesting overnight? And Thank so, you. and I, and I, I don't want to just sound like I'm, the podcast is all about just, um, complimenting, you know, Aaliyah Chapin, but I mean, it, that really is how I felt about it. But what, you know, the thing that I thought at the time and I still wonder is how in the world did you, how in the world did you find it in yourself to go from something like 2012 all the way to 2019, which is very academic, very realistic, very naturalistic to something mm -hmm. completely, well, not completely, but 70% non-objective. Yeah. How did you yeah. make that creative leap that, how did you make that shift? seemingly effortlessly from looking at it from the outside well that's the outside uh for sure um i'm the i'm a type of artist who you probably maybe notice on instagram i don't post very often because i 
uh, I'm really just working kind of privately and then I show it. So it looks effortless because you didn't see all the stuff that was happening before um, privately that I wasn't sharing with anyone. Um, how can I describe it? So I've always loved realism and I still do. But I was coming to a point in 2019 and it was a couple of years coming, but really hit then where I felt like I was painting myself into a bit of a corner. Um, part of it may have been that I had so much success immediately that I kind of felt this pressure that I needed to keep doing that. And maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit rebellious inside, but I was like, I, I don't want to keep doing that just because I'm expected to. Mm -hmm. um, and I also can't paint something if I don't want to paint it. So I, I knew that there was a change happening and I didn't know what it was going to be. And at some point, winter, maybe like January 2020, I think. So like before the pandemic, just before the pandemic, I started going to my studio and I had gessoed like a bunch of pieces of paper, like, you know, 30 pieces of paper. And I just took a brush, a big, big brush and like a big, you know, uh, like a little Tupperware thing of paint, basically of oil paint. And I, with my non-dominant hand, I just started doing these like really bad drawings in quotation marks, bad drawings. I don't think that they're bad, but I had, I was just telling myself like, make, make bad stuff, just get something out because I was feeling like I was getting to a point in realism where I was so tight and controlled that I couldn't breathe anymore. And it's not that I didn't like the outcome or didn't like realism or didn't like painting realistically, but I was just getting to this point where it was too tight. And I felt too constricted to um, relying on my source, which for me is photography, felt too restricted to relying on photography. And I am someone who, even as a kid, I hardly did stuff for my imagination. So doing anything that wasn't based on life or a photo was like very new for me, but I knew I just needed to do something. So I just was in my studio, just making these like, um, quote, quotation, bad paintings um, to get something out. And they were vaguely realist, but are vaguely recognizable as like some sort of figure, but um, hardly so. <laughs> and, and those, so those sort of sat around in my studio for a while and I would do them occasionally when I just needed to get some energy out and just like needed to get free in a way. And um, then the pandemic hit us and everything got canceled and the world was just completely changing. And something about that really allowed me to go deeper and slow down. Um, and I think I was meditating and I was just sort of meditating on these, like these, these paintings that were in my studio, these like bad paintings all over the floor were in my, in my head and it just sort of came together. And if you scroll over to the right, um, or actually no, it's the one on the left, the red one, yeah. you can stay there. The, the red one, that was one of the first ones. And that's kind of what this time felt like. There's this like purging of stuff, mm -hmm. <laughs> just purging of, of, I don't even know what. Um, and then you scroll over to the right. Uh, yeah. So that, um, and one more. So these two in the middle, the green one, um, well, the, the green one in the middle and then the blue one on the left mm -hmm. and then the red one was the first three. Um, they just sort of popped into my head. Actually, I think it was that blue one sort of uh, thalo blue one and the oppression blue one on the left. Um, I just saw it in my head. Not exactly like that, but I, I saw it in my head and, and I decided to create it in the studio and see what would happen. Um, because I knew I didn't want to throw away realism entirely, but I, I knew that there was something else in me that I had to get out that, that needed to come from inside of me. And that's really what I see these paintings as like in the past and all my work before I was painting from the outside. I was painting other people. I was painting from reference photos that I would take um, in a sort of documentary style. So it's kind of gathering and then I would paint from there, whereas these were coming from very intuitive, emotional places inside of me. And then I'm finding I'm finding my source images to create the painting from there. So they're coming from the inside out instead of the outside in. Um, oh, I like, like the way you put that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really interesting. So 
I'm, I'm interested in what these, these so-called lousy paintings um, look like. Do you have any of those laying around your studio? Uh, yeah, let me grab one. Okay. Let's see. So it's not actually one of those originals, but it's the same sort of style. Oh, Right, let me right. see. Okay. Here. Yeah. Okay. You can see that. Even So that's that's what they interesting look like. though. So, okay. You know, a thought that I have, and you might disagree with this. I mean, I know this is sort of a, I don't know, maybe a contentious issue with some artists, but one of my pet peeves as a realist has always been how people have always said to justify Picasso's work, that he was a master before he went into abstract and he was bored of realism. And I said, that Yeah. was a bunch of bunk. He, he was the worst in his school, worst in his class. He struggled with realism. And then he went in. with you. It's legit. Like you literally did master realism and, and you didn't just abandon it, but you somehow took it 10 steps further by, by, as you put it, bringing yourself into it more. Um, so it's really cool to see that actually happening. you know, Thank some, you. someone who's mastered realism and what they, what they do with it. So tell me a little bit more about the process. This is what I, well, tell me if I'm correct. This is what I think I'm seeing. So you do one of those drawings Mm and -hmm. then you say that you had that this one on the, on the right, sorry, the left kind of in your head, but was it in your head because it was a product of all of that experimentation and then once you once you put all your time and energy into that experimentation with your non-dominant hand that it started to create this uh sort of library of imagery in your mind that led to and evolved into these more complex compositions or was it like a dream like dali would have had <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I would say that, I mean, I don't know what Delhi's mind was like, but I would say that's probably what he was doing was, was just a library. I mean, I think all, all human beings, we have a library of something in our heads. Most of us is images, but I do have a friend who actually can't see images. Um, she's fascinating. She's a poet. She's amazing. Um, totally different podcast. Uh, so, Hmm. <laughs> yeah, sounds interesting though. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it, We, for me, I, I always have, there's so many images in my head, but I um, hadn't actually looked at them very much my entire art life because I was so used to looking outwards. And so something with, you know, me being, uh, well, COVID happening and then me getting, yeah, kind of bored of realism and feeling like I, there's something else I needed to do. Um, Well, maybe I'm I, asking, oh, go ahead. Well, I just like closed my eyes and just watched the image. I just sort of watched it change. And then, and then I'll tell you literally how I make these though. I'll get a bit more, a little bit less woo woo and out there and, and a little more concrete. So how I actually make these is that, so we'll just describe that, that one on the left, the blue one on the left. Um, uh, there was a drawing that looked kind of like that one that I just showed. Um, and I, what I did was I went into the studio And I put my camera on a tripod and had it on a timer. And I put myself in the position as much as possible of that drawing, which is like anatomically impossible, Right. which is interesting. So then I try to get photos of myself in these poses. And then what I did um, in Photoshop, I love Photoshop. I'm terrible at it, but I, I know the basics. I, I kind of put these two together. So I had a photo of my, this bad painting, bad drawing. Mm -hmm. Um, I shouldn't call them bad. I really love them. <laughs> Yeah, you they're know what very I mean? cool. And then I took a photos of myself and I put them together in a way that felt like it, it, it felt right. And it was sort of what I was seeing in my imagination and then, um, shifted the color around because I really wanted to expand my color. That was just part of it. Like, there's no way I'm going to stay with natural lighting. Like, oh my God, you can say so much with color. So Mm hmm I just played around with it and then went into the painting and the paintings start with, um, I'm priming the canvas with the color that I'm going to use for the painting. And so then I'm going into the painting with a big brush and really loosely getting in this, this gesture. And it's, it's, it's changing from the little tiny 
bad drawing, it's definitely changing. I'm not trying to make it exactly like that, but trying to get that same energy. So I'm laying that in there and then I'm building up around that and building up the realism around it and building up the, the ground and the sky. Um, and then as I'm painting, things change. Like this is very different from the image I saw in my head when I first meditated on it, because that's just the, the joy of creativity is just right. following the three. And so the sky was totally different than I thought it would be. Um, and uh, then the, gra the ground was, I just went into my backyard and took some photos of my feet, like in the weedy corner of my garden and um, used those. So I'm, I'm just pulling together a lot of different photos and then my imagination and then coming in painting it. Um, so that's essentially how all of these paintings happened. Hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, from one painter to another, one thing that I think I would have struggled with if I were you. And well, first of all, let me let me preface it by saying one thing that's beautiful about these three is your simplifying of the palette. You clearly are very good with designing color. And even like you say this in this uh, yellowish green painting on the right, you still have these beautiful variations in color, particularly in the skin, the face, the arms and so on. But then it's like you'd be a great interior decorator. You have such beautiful des color design sensitivity. But that said, that leads to, to my question. And that is, if we go back to your older paintings, um, let's, I'm just randomly going to go to 2013. One of the things I notice, and unfortunately you can't see too close. Actually, yeah, let's go back to 2011. Cause I think you can see this closer on one of your first paintings, like right here. Mm -hmm. This is one of the things I love about your work and that I can relate to because I see myself as sort of a, like a skin fanatic. I'm just so interested in all the color variation in skin. And yeah. that's so always what I'm looking for. And that's what drew me to your work. You kind of had to let that go in your new work because you've got this beautiful, almost stippling of color, which makes it breathe. Mm -hmm. And yet when you go to, um, when you go to your new work, wait, did I go to the wrong page here? Let me see. No, that's the new work. Oh, that that's is right. the new work. Oh, you have your picture on the front. That threw me off. Okay. So yeah. yeah, when you go to your new work, there's still color in it, but you kind of had to let go a little bit of that flesh. Yeah. What, 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 what I'm interpreting is, um, as being the same thing that I have this desire to really, really, uh, flesh out flesh, <laughs> you know, like really, <laughs> really explore flesh. So was that a difficult, am I, am I reading too much into this or was that something you had to work through when you moved into um, this new work? Well, I mean, I chose to do this because I wanted, because I wanted to, and I actually, I would say it's easier to see when they're in person. These paintings are so much better in person than on Of course the they are. Yeah. Um, but I actually don't feel like I had to let that go. I just oh. had to change it. So in, in, so if you, if you saw them in person, um, so you what still you have see, all that variation in color, say, in this blue leg it's right very, here. I mean, it's very condensed. So it's maybe not quite as much, but it's it's a very condensed. So what I'm doing in here, and part of the, I mean, the reason why I chose to do each of these paintings in a different color was because I really wanted to experience what it was like to work in different colors. Right. In, in different color, uh, kind of color chapter and, and see how much I could find in there. So you know, warms and cools. Oh my God, they're amazing. And getting right. to play with those, I absolutely love them. So what happens when you're trying to find warms and cools within blue in a really subtle way? Mm -hmm. It challenges you. So my palette is definitely limited, but I'm still finding warms and cools. There's still reds in that. There's still um, yellows in that. They're just very condensed. And oh my gosh, that sounds them. really hard. It is, yeah, it is, it is very challenging. Um, but I wanted to challenge myself in that way. And I've, so I've had to kind of invent it. Like, yes, Photoshop does give me some information when I'm shifting colors, but like so often it's not actually what I want. So I'm really having to invent it and just play around and see like what, yeah, what are all the warms and cools that I can find in within this thalo Prussian blue? You know, there's there's reds in here, there's oranges in here, there's greens, there's yellows, but the overall is thalo blue. So it was, uh -huh. it was a really fun challenge and also just getting to experience what it's like to be within a color for a certain period of time 
um, like greens and blues, just like I'm very comfortable. You can see there's blue all around me. I'm very comfortable in blue and I love blue. Mm -hmm. um, whereas reds, like the red one was really challenging for me and uncomfortable for really? me. Really? It's an uncomfortable painting as well. Like it's supposed to be. Um, but trying to find the warms and cools within, within that body, within that, those within legs. Within the red one. Within, yeah, in the red one without making it feel like a burnt lobster, you know, um, it was very challenging and uh, oh, it, was a, it was a good challenge, but it was a hard challenge for me. So, And I don't know how many really people on this planet can really appreciate that and not, not to, <laughs> not to elevate the artist, but yes. I mean, yeah. I should... It's, I guess now that you're talking about it, it is, it is, I, I should have known better because if that was painted monochromatically pink, it would look like a plastic leg and it doesn't, it looks like a breathing leg as <laughs> legs obviously don't breathe, but you know what I mean? So yes, no, um, I... it looks like a living leg with blood pumping through it. And same with this, this, uh, you say these are thalos. I would have thought they were cobalts, but you're working in thalos here. Uh, which, well, the left one is, is, um, no cobalt, actually. No, the far left one is more ultramarine. Oh yeah, that's what and I would have expected. Too. That's also ultramarine. I, I th it's it oh, might be Prussian. Oh, this one might be thalo. So, okay. It's maybe not thalo. I think I'm using thalo now. This one is either Prussian or indigo. Okay. Well, nonetheless, yeah, oh. I guess it is. I mean, they could they couldn't possibly look this lifelike if you weren't using temperature variation. Um, yeah. So, so, so you got, so basically what you're saying is you, you managed to break away from a love of skin. I'm assuming you have kind of a love of painting skin oh, by, I I by challenging yourself to paint skin in a more difficult way. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess you're right. Or I would say just in a different way. In a different way. Because I wouldn't, you know, sometimes it's more difficult, but painting in a, you know, natural light setting is difficult. Um, I don't I know, this looks harder. This looks harder to me. <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe it's, it's not, but fun. it looks it looks more difficult to me. <laughs> yeah, um, it was just fun. I don't know. I I've I had more fun with these paintings than I had in in like such a long time paintings. So, so what about what about from a business perspective? Um, oh yeah. What? Uh, what? <laughs> were you just scared out of your mind on how these would be received? Because you're already a, a rock star. I mean, this is obviously you don't have to see yourself that way, but many of us do in the painting world. And then you just completely start writing a whole new style of music, so to speak. You know, were, were you nervous yeah. about how it would be received? Yeah, for sure. Definitely nervous about it. Um, and yeah, financially speaking, yeah, it's it it's that was really scary and is scary and I'm in a transition right now. Um, but I have to paint what I want to paint. Yeah. Like I cannot paint something if I don't want to paint it. Um, I would be, I think I'd be depressed if I sort of just became a business and just sort of painted right. the like the Chapin auntie's stuff forever. I, I'm very proud of that work. I'm not saying I don't like it. I, I love that work. I'm proud of it, but I, didn't want to become a brand where that's just what I paint, even if I'd make a lot of money because, um, you're I, done know, with I just it. can't work that way. I can't work that way. So yeah, yeah, mostly, mostly done. I mean, I might, I might do the occasional one for reasons, but like basically done. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, I have to, I, for better or worse, I have to be true to myself as who I am as an individual, as a human in this world. Like I have to be true to that person and, that person is evolving yeah. and my experience it is to be human is evolving and these are a more accurate description of how i how it feels to be human to me now and those were then and in the future this will change i know and it already is changing the work that's in my studio now which i can't show you yet oh is, is an can't we get a sneak peek <laughs> oh, <laughs> All you get is, um but like so it's it's evolving and shifting now definitely you know in this it's in this new realm but things are shifting now and i just um i i have to like i i just have to and i just figure out the financial part but <laughs> I, you can't you're not telling me that these aren't selling as well 
Uh, I am telling you that. Oh, yeah, you gotta I'm, be freaking I'm kidding. In a transition me. for a new audience. Yeah, anyone who wants to buy any, please Holy let me know. Contact cow. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. I thought these would be flying off the walls. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, well, hopefully at some point they will, but. Oh, they the will. Moment. They will. There's no way they're not going to just all catch on. There's no way. Well, Thank we'll you. see. Well, I mean, who am I, I but yeah. Wow. I'm not going to stop me because I have, you know, as I said, I have to paint what I paint and I'm managing scrape by and, and I, yeah, I, art is my life. I don't want to ruin, ruin it by right. forcing myself to paint only what I know will sell. Well, if I was I wealthy, just... I'd buy every single one on the website. I mean, it's, uh, they're <laughs> unbelievable. Well, let me, let's talk about your aunties project a little bit. Yeah. We, it would be crazy to, you know, do this whole yeah, podcast go without going into the thing that sort of made you famous. Um, Thank you for about the new work though. I really appreciate that. Yeah. And I, we might even go back to that. I really do love that stuff. So, okay. So here, I've got a lot of questions about this stuff. So as an art teacher, I cannot get a middle-aged woman as a model in my studio for my students. That's <laughs> And you had, you've got like an army of them. Like, what, I mean, yeah. how in the world did you, how do you get people to pose for these paintings? Uh, well, the ones we're looking at now, some of them are my friends, like okay. my childhood. Um, well, and some of them aren't middle-aged. These are younger women, of yeah, course. These are my, yeah, they're my friends. Um, I mean, they're my mom and her friends. Like these aren't models. They're my aunties. That's right. why they're called the aunties. They're, they're, they're my aunties. So. Um, meaning there are women in my life who I've been really close with, uh, who have known me since I was, some of them like were in the room when I was born. Um, and they all and happen to be comfortable with being completely nude in these Not, paintings. No, there's, there's more, of, there's more women who I didn't paint. There, there's a large community of people who I could have painted more than okay. what I've painted. Okay. I've, I've painted, but, um, yeah, they were so, but it started out as my thesis project in school. So like, they didn't really know what they were getting themselves into. <laughs> I didn't get myself into. Um, I just, I, so the way this all started is I was, I was in grad school in New York and I was so excited to be there, but also completely overwhelmed with like, oh my God, what do I want to say with my art? I know how I want to paint. I know that I want to paint in this realistic way, but like, you know, I was really developing skills there, um, technical skills. Um, but I was really at a loss for what I wanted to paint. Like what, what, what could I say that hadn't been said? What could I say that, um, would be interesting? What could I say that felt true to me? Like I, I really struggled with that. Mm -hmm. Um, cause a lot of the art that I saw in, in New York was like either, uh, kind of overly sentimental and sort of about nothing and that I wasn't interested in that, or it was like really, you know, minimal and abstract and, and just had zero meaning or emotion whatsoever. And so like none of these, or there was like really negative, you know, uh, angsty art that also didn't feel like me. And I was like, I don't, what do I paint? And I was, a, I was at a bit of a crisis. I was really struggling. Um, and you know how crises go, they kind of break you open and yeah. they're important. And what I was left with was like, well, the body, I've always loved painting the body. And, um, I, uh, I, I have an autoimmune disease. I've had it since I was 13. So like I, my relationship with my body is like, I've had a complex relationship with it. Um, and I also knew that I just wanted to paint what I knew. Like, that's the only thing I could do is just paint what I know. And I think, I think a, a teacher there told me that, um, Wade Schumann, I think he, I think he's the one who's like, Aaliyah, just stop trying to save the world with your art, which I was trying to do, make big, meaningful paintings. Right. Never worked. Felt control. And uh, he was just like, paint what you know. Paint what you know. And so I mm. did. I was just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the aunties if, if they wouldn't mind posing for me. And I will just start there. So it was and just so a I, portrait. These are just nude portraits. You're interested in the figure. You, these are people you care about. They're, they're nothing more than a portrait at this point. Yeah, go back to the 2011. That'll okay. be more. He goes more. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really think of them necessarily as portraits. Because, well, I guess those two are portraits, but. Um, well, portraits of a I body. So. Yeah. I mean, what I'm saying is they're not conceptual yeah. pieces at this point in your exactly. career. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, like, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to say something with these like huge and meaningful. Yeah. Um, because whenever I tried to do that, they, the paintings felt contrived because they were too obvious. Um, I was really just trying to capture what I knew and what I had seen growing up. Not that I grew up in a nudist colony, they weren't <laughs> naked. Right. Exactly, but, um, you know, these women are incredible, unusual, uh, unique, wild ladies. And um, to me, that was totally normal growing up to have these types of people around. And but when I went out into the world, I realized that's not, you know, that's not normal. Um, but it's what I know. And so I just, yeah, I really just wanted to paint what I know. Literally, it was just how can I go back to my roots? I know that I want to paint the body. I don't want to just paint another uh, model in a pose, um, a young, pretty female model in a pose. Um, I really wanted to get at something more honest, I think, more real. Mm -hmm. um, I think probably unconsciously, I also, as like a woman growing up in this world, really wanted to see stuff that I hadn't ever seen that maybe I needed to see. Um, but I wasn't thinking about that consciously. I wasn't, I was definitely wasn't thinking about trying to like break out beauty standards at right. this point. Um, I, know that, I know that the work does that, but it was really just me wanting to go back to my roots and paint what I know and um, really explore painting skin and the body. Mm -hmm. So that's where it all began. Wow. And did it ever evolve into more conceptual pieces? Yeah, I think over time it began to. So, so can you show me some of that where you feel like uh, it started to get more conceptual? Maybe just go, you know, I don't know how well, how well I know the years go to 2013 to go to any, anything, anything in the Let's middle. Let's try we'll, 2014. We'll, I'm going to talk about some. Let's see what happens in 2014. Oh, this is a, yeah, I'm glad we're talking about 2014 because this I mean, is a yeah, great. I would, thank you. This yeah, it's so, so incredible. And it's, thank you. And it's yeah, 10 feet favorite. long. Yeah, it's big. It's a big one. See, this, um, is, this goes back well, to my original question. How in the world do you have so much work? I don't even. I mean, that one took me four months. That's still fast. I know. I, I, I don't know. It's the way that I paint. But I, wow. <laughs> um, if you look up close, there's a lot of brush marks. Like, yeah. you know, it's, they're not super tight, um, even though they very much look like it from here. Yeah. I would say this is more conceptual, but not overtly so. Mm -hmm. Like what I'm, what I was trying to do with all these, all these paintings was not. I'd never had an idea beforehand of what I wanted to paint, and then go in there and say, "Okay, guys, let's pose, let's pose like this," because then that's inserting too much of my kind of uh, mind conceptual self into them. And I'd really learned that when I tried to work from my mind um, and concept and thinking and thoughts the paintings always felt contrived. Whereas if I worked more from my intuition and my gut and sort of like this sense in my body, um, the paintings were better. So what I did with these, the photo shoots that would do is just get the aunties together in, in a field in the woods somewhere in the property of one of them. And um, would just take photos. It was a couple hours of me just really documenting them playing and being strange. And I would guide them a little bit sometimes, but I really tried to just create space for them to do whatever they wanted. And then from there, I would look through the hundreds of photos and find one that kind of called to me. And sometimes I'd have to use a couple um, different ones. Mostly though, it's just one photo and then I'm totally changing the backgrounds. I'm inventing those mostly. Um, so this one is more conceptual, but it comes, it's, it's conceptual more from a discovery place, mm -hmm. discovery from the outside world still, but still a discovery versus coming from my mind and then being illustrated out in the world. Right. Um, if that makes sense. It does. So they're, they You're were just become, the concept kind of uh, create itself in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just like the midwife for it, I guess. I mean, yeah. I'm just guiding and helping it into the world and, trying to stay out of its way because if i got in its way too much then again it would feel contrived it would feel overly controlled um hmm. i was really just trying to get out of its way so in a way you're still being a documentary artist at this point oh yeah for sure i'd say the documentary stuff really stopped in the last couple of years right right otherwise it was it was definitely more of yeah documentary discovering stories and, mm -hmm. you know, concepts, but. 
yeah, through more of a documentary sense. Yeah. So, I mean, it's amazing to me how these women, how playful they are. I mean, particularly in the first one. And actually, yeah. <laughs> actually, both the first two, these two here. I mean, yeah. what an awesome group of women that participated in yeah. this process. <laughs> yeah, they really do, do this and help you out with this. So at this point, you know, we started talking about this, like, how did you get these women? Well, at first it was, oh, just for, for Leah's thesis project, of course, we'll support her. And then it was like, oh, my God, this is going to be public. Like, uh, I grew up in a small town of a thousand people, like everyone knows everyone. So and all you know, these women are part of that town. Uh, they might live outside of the town, but yeah, in the in the community. I grew wow. up on, on Whidbey Island in okay. north of Seattle. So it's an island. So it's a, you know, it's a community. Yeah. And um, yeah, and they, so every, you know, a little, any, anyone from the small community makes it at all in the world. It's a very big deal. So like the paintings were pretty public and, and this was a bit of a hard experience. Like, I think just for me to feel like, oh, I've, I've made my aunties feel vulnerable because now they're getting stopped at the grocery store, you they know, literally and, were. Yeah. I mean, cause it's such a small town. Everyone knows each other and it's like, wow. oh, I saw the movie of you and mostly it's great, but there were some, you know, some more negative experiences, but, um, not overtly or purposefully negative, but just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it was at this point though, they, they knew the work was going to be more public and out there. And, and I asked them and they were, they, they said, yes, they still wanted to do it. And, um, you know, some of them, I don't use their names. Like I won't ever say their names just for some privacy, but, uh, they've, they've mostly all continued, continued. I mean, I'm not painting them now, but, um, right. yeah, they're, they're incredible. They're incredible people. Yeah. And the confidence they, the self-confidence they must have too, because they're, yeah. they're ordinary people, you know, yep. just ordinary people, but completely they seem completely comfortable in their own skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that was, I think that right there is it. It's like seeing older women comfortable in their skin was really good for me to see in my mid to late twenties. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish that I had seen that before, you know? Um, I mean, I had, cause I grew up around these women, but like, out in the world, you know, in like magazines and anything. I, I just hadn't really seen that much. And it was good to see that. Um, but I have to say, they're also, you know, they're not just 100% confident and comfortable. There's definitely, vulner there's definitely vulnerability. There's definitely discomfort. Like they, they definitely feel all these things. And it's, I, I think that's taught me a lot too, because it's not about just completely feeling no fear or no discomfort or no vulnerability. It's really about feeling comfortable with all of those things, comfortable with the discomfort of being yourself that mm -hmm. I think is the biggest that mm -hmm. I'm still trying to learn how to do and probably will always be striving for. Yeah. You and the rest of us, right? Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go to 1617. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I was looking through your website before the podcast and saw this one and it just, yeah, that one the scale nine months. It took nine that months, a, that one? This was the nine month one. Yeah, this one was insanely long, um, but I also loved painting this one. Um, wow. Huge, it's, it's 18 feet long um, and was inspired by a hiking, a backpacking trip my friend Max and I did um, in 2014 or so. When did I do this painting? Um, uh, it doesn't say. Oh, wait, it probably right. does. Oh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, it would I had been backpacked. 16, 17. Okay, so I, but I did, I had the backpacking trip before this. So um, I had this backpacking trip with my friend Max, and I was just like up at the top of the world in the middle of the night. And I was still living in New York at the time. So I was just out here visiting, out in the Pacific Northwest visiting, and um, just like felt this complete oneness with everything around me. I know it sounds cliche, but just really felt that and also felt like I felt so small um, mm -hmm. within the space and and yet also completely part of everything. And there's something about that I just really wanted to bring back to the studio. And um, and so I my friend Max and I hiked up the next year and took photos at three in the morning 
um, of all the rocks and stars. And, and I ended up putting this image together using maybe six different photos. And the, the women there are actually from one of the earlier auntie's photo shoots that I, like a daytime photo shoot. And I'd always kind of loved this little trio here and I just didn't know what they would be yet. And then they just sort of worked perfectly in this painting. So they came into this painting. Um, so they, you photographed them in the middle of the day and you managed to make it look yeah. like moonlight. Yeah, just um, <sighs> cooling temperatures and, and then, you know, playing with it it, using paint too, yeah. you know, it's not all of them in Photoshop. Photoshop kind of gets me in the direction and then I have to, you know, think about like, well, what is this light? What's the temperature of this light? And is this, is this working mm -hmm. in the scene? And, um, and also the thing is like, you can get away with a lot, like this wouldn't actually look like this no, at night, but, but it's convincing but it gets, nonetheless. It yeah. Yeah. Like I've, I've learned a lot about, about that or really realized that it's not, you don't need to get it super perfect and accurate and what it actually would be it's you can get it pretty close and it will be convincing um and then it also gives it this other kind of magic of like this is convincing and yet it's not you know mm -hmm. there's this sort of other thing so i again just embracing those accidents embracing the fact that i i'm not going to you know, drag these women up to the top of the mountain, a really insane, intense hike and have them pose naked at three in the morning. I, I couldn't get good photos anyways. So embracing those challenges and realizing that by me actually inventing them a little bit and having to really think about things and play around with things and make things up, I'm, I'm able to make it feel a little bit otherworldly, which is great. You know, why not try to do that while still mm -hmm. making it feel solid? Mm-hmm. Was there a, a time in your, you know, throughout your artistic journey where you realized that you didn't need to be so literal? Um, yeah, I think actually this painting started helping me see that. Mm -hmm. The painting of the rocks. Again, you really can't see it in this image at all, but there's a lot of brush marks in there. And I was really realizing that um, if I just allowed paint to be paint, it could give me a lot of life versus trying to describe something perfectly. Um, and I, I just started letting, yeah, I definitely started letting go of precision, letting go of trying to make things look perfectly accurate and started just trusting myself a bit more, probably around this time. And then that, you know, probably planted some seeds for the work I'm doing now, um, I imagine. I mean, just think about that now, but the more I found comfort in painting in this way, the more I was able to kind of let go mm -hmm. and trust myself more. And then now it's just the ultimate form of letting go and trusting myself. Um, yeah. And I think that's, it's just the journey of being an artist is you, you do learn to trust yourself. And I think the trick is to not get stuck in that trust. Right. That you're not interested anymore, at least for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you said that because I thought I saw this, I mean, I thought I recognized this as sort of a transitional piece between what you were doing and what you are doing now. I mean, because you could almost take this leg out of here and uh, and put it in yep. one of these and put it, say, oh, where is it? Oh, yeah, Let's you got to go to. Yeah, you got to go to 2021. <laughs> um, yeah, and you could stick yeah. it right in one of these paintings right in here, as far like right here. So I think I actually... I think you're totally right. Like I was starting to play with, like when I was trying to make things kind of nighttime and dusk, they were yeah. getting more blue and I, how much I loved that. Yeah. And so with these, I was just, well, let me go all the way. Like, let me go like more punchy color. Like, let me really just punch this, this color. Why does it need to be realistic? Isn't it interesting <laughs> you know, how art evolves that way in our minds? Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting to look back. Like I hadn't really thought about that piece as being this connected to this new work, but you're, you're totally right. It really, it really was a big connection. So thank you for pointing that out. Hmm. Um, so tell me, uh, I want to know more, more uh, about your process because I'm still so fascinated by how much work you've produced. And as a painter, I, I really want to sort of, uh, suck up your powers in a way. <laughs> um, no. So you say you paint, you let the brush do the work. 
And when you're, I wish I could zoom in. And for all of you watching, I mean, I imagine some of you are a little frustrated too. We all want to see the skin. We all, I mean, I do yeah. anyway. I want to see those brush strokes you're talking about because when you look at it from this distance, everything is just so in focus. Um, yeah. But again, when we go back to 2011, I think that's where you can really see it because you've got the details of the faces here. Yeah. And my assumption you, is that the skin it, everywhere looks like that. What's that? Here, click on one of those images. It should get a little bigger, not too much bigger. No, it doesn't. It doesn't? No. Oh, it's funny. It should open. I don't know why it doesn't. Yeah, it's weird. That's okay. Uh, but anyway, I think we can get the idea with these portraits. And I know these are some of your earlier work, but my assumption is that that's still at least kind of how you approach painting. Yeah, it is. Although the work got tighter kind of unintentionally. Oh, it, did. it did. Yeah, I, I like the, the aliveness in this earlier work. Um, and it's just my pursuit of realism. Like I've been obsessed with realism my whole life. And that pursuit got me a little too, too far, kind of went over overboard, got a little too tight. Mm -hmm. um, for my own liking in terms of the act of painting. I like how they turned out, but the act of painting, like I just want them to be a little bit more, more loose. Um, and are you painting in, are you painting in layers? I mean, tell, yes. tell me from day to day how you approach it. Let's say you've got a, let's, I'm going to pick a painting here. Okay. Um, I'm going to pick one of my favorites. I think 2000, well, 2020, 21 is my favorite, but I'm, I'm thinking more technically. So we're going to go to some of your more crazy ambitious stuff <laughs> let's see oh, yeah. um 2005 2015 no that's not the year let me see it's all amazing so don't think this the wrong way i just want to go to some of the stuff where it was like okay here we go so that's pretty ambitious 100 inches um yeah so tell me day one I yeah. Mean, how so day do you, one. How do you approach something like this from day one to day? I mean, obviously you're not going to go through every day, but just break it down into maybe four or five steps on how you approach. I can this. break it down. So yeah. After I create, are we talking about just painting, not the no, reference? No, painting image? and process. Yeah. So the reference image too. Sure. I mean, so whatever like you're for comfortable this, with. No, I'm comfortable sharing whatever. I just don't want to bore you guys. Um, so with this one in particular, um, I had taken photos of, of the aunties outside and they were in, they were, they were doing this. Right. And so I, um, basically chose the photo out of hundreds of photos and in Photoshop kind of took the background out and sort of invented my own background, did it really badly in Photoshop. So I'd get a basic idea. And then what I'm doing is I, I stretch my canvas, um, and which is enormous. This one particular is a bit too large, I think. Um, and the first day I'm just getting the underpainting in. So I'm using Sennelier brown pink, which is actually yellow. Like all those earlier paintings, you saw the sort of bit of yellow splotches yeah. in the background. That's Sennelier brown pink. Yeah, brown why pink do they call the that brown pink? Not to get out of It's so weird. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. But I love that color for my mm -hmm. underpainting. So I I'm basically roughing in the whole thing with that color and how I'm doing that is I have my little laptop and I've gridded it out in Photoshop, mm -hmm. maybe like one foot squares. And then I'm gridding out my painting into like one foot squares and getting those proportions. Right. Um, and then I'm just laying in the whole, the whole thing in paint. And I'm, I'm using the, the grid I'm doing in, in paint as well. And I'm wiping out the grid as soon as I can because I don't want to be painting in a grid. It's really just and to get the basic And these are big grids. Drawing. It's just to manage this huge canvas. It's just to manage, exactly. It's just yeah. to manage the huge scale of it so I can make sure that like everything is in basically the right place. Right. Um, cause I don't want to project cause that just isn't right for me at all. And, and there isn't really any other way to do it when they're this big. Right. Um, and so then I'm wiping it out cause I hate to paint within any sort of structure. Right. And, um, and then I'm just diving right in with color and I'm using full palette after. So this is like that underpainting has dried. So is the underpainting and it's just pretty really... refined? I mean, are you getting likenesses in the underpainting or are you just getting general proportions? I'm getting, I'm getting it pretty close, but I'm not being, I'm not being too crazy accurate, but I'm definitely trying to get it fairly close, like as okay. close as possible, but I'm doing probably this whole underpainting in a day or two um, okay. for, for one this large. Um, 
so I'm getting that as accurate as I, as I can, but I'm not worrying too much about like value. Definitely not worrying about value, worrying right. more about drawing. Where is this, you know, is this curve of the back feel right? Um, and once that's in, I let that dry and then I'm going right in with just my full palette of colors. Um, and then I'm laying this all in and I'm, I'm, I'm being pretty quick about it, but I'm using fairly small brushes, not as small as I'll use at the end, but maybe like this big. Like three quarter that? inch or something. Oh, yeah, probably that. Um, and trying to get it more accurate in terms of the drawing every time. And then I'm layering every, every, like I let it dry and then I come in with another layer. So you'll layer do the you... whole painting. And so you'll start, you start with this yellow color. Yeah. Uh, and then you do the whole painting and you get all of your violets and purples and blues and whatnot in and, yep. and refine the I drawing a little bit, but it's still mm -hmm. rough. Yep. And then you come back in with another layer. Yep. I come back in with another layer and I'm the, I'm painting in very thin layers. So even if I'm using opaque white, like there's still gonna be a bit of translucency because I'm also, I'm using um, uh, brushes that have a bit of grit to them. Like I don't like really smooth brushes. Um, so I'm allowing uh, a lot of the light from the underpainting to come through. And essentially the process is that I'm I'm weaving layers together. Like okay. that's how I think of it, it's weaving layers together. So uh, I'll do, you know, underpainting first layer of color. And then the next layer of color, what I'm actually doing is kind of doing a, a tinted oiling out or a glaze, I guess, but not really. So I'm, I'm using um, Galkid Light and I'm mixing it with a little bit of whatever color, like for these blue paintings, I'm gonna be mixing it with probably an indigo or Prussian blue, okay. just a little bit, being it over the area I'm about to paint, wiping that down. So it's only a very, very, very thin layer. So then I feel like I'm painting wet into wet and it has a very slight tint to it. And then I'm just, I'm, I'm diving in there and putting in all my tiny little brush marks. And I'm actually not covering every single inch of the canvas. Like there's going to be little, like I say weaving because there's going to be layers of this and then another layer of this and another layer of this, another layer of this. And between each of those layers, there's, there's this sort of transparent um, tinted oiling out or a transparent glaze that is helping to unify and right. also helping to bring luminosity to the painting. Um, and it's just this building up of, of these little tiny layers of these tiny little brush marks like this um, over time that ends up making it feel a little very, I get these paintings in one go. Like I just, I don't know how to paint all prima like that. Like I just can't, I can't do it. Um, and it wouldn't give me what I want. So I, I really want to build them up over time. And then when you look up close, you can, you can see that there's this weaving of these tiny brush marks that every little mark is a little bit different. And, and that does several things that it, it, you know, I said it brings luminosity it makes it feel alive, but it also, um, well, I guess it, it makes, it makes it feel more, it, it makes it feel more like skin and not yeah. plastic. Yeah. It's, it's plastic. You're going to be really covering it. If I was painting a Barbie or something, I'd be really like trying to very, very smoothly. Um, but if I'm painting real skin, like if you look at your hand, it's so many other little marks in it, so many marks. And so if I can build it up using these little tiny brush marks over layers that are that, that sort of been unified through these transparencies as well, then it's going to feel more like the texture of skin. And I'm going to have all of these little kind of accidental brush marks and accidental colors that wasn't quite, weren't quite right. Um, I don't pre-mix very much. I, I just pre-mix tints. So I have all my colors and then I'll mix each of them with white and then that's it. Um, so that every time I load my, my brush with paint, it's going to be slightly different interpretation. And so when you get layers and layers of that, it's going to build up this complexity that feels a lot more alive than if I was going to pre-mix with palette knife, hold it up to my reference and, and like that, uh, just doesn't work for me. So I, I really want to get all those attempts and all those accidents and bring as much life as I can into the painting. Hmm. So what size brushes are we talking about on these layers where you're kind of weaving? The I'm using, together? we'll grab one really quick. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. So it is. Oh, that's not small. Oh yeah, they are small. You're holding them really close to the camera. 
Yes. Yeah, hold one next <laughs> to your hand. Hold one next to your fingers. The brush is next to your fingers. Yeah, okay. I'm not the best for scale. Um, so, yeah, you can, like, see it's, like, the size yeah, of my, so quarter inch, small maybe. In my fingertips. Um, yeah, it's a size. I read this. Size, this is a size two. Oh, they're pretty small. And, and they're filberts, it looks like, mostly. Yeah, so I use filberts, mostly filberts, sometimes rounds, but mostly filberts. Um, size size zero, zero to uh, what would be the biggest? Oh, you're using really small ones, zero, yeah. zero sometimes. Well, okay. no, but zero, zero, that would be for like if I'm painting an eye or like a toenail or something. Right. Or right. some hair. Or hair. When I'm painting. Yeah. I'm painting those in the skin. Skin is probably going to be a size size two to one one to two okay for skin so there's a reason why i like to use this size of brush and why i like to paint larger than life yeah because i feel like these sizes of brush when i'm using them in this sort of little dabbling flickering way yeah they actually create the feeling of of skin they actually create the texture that skin looks like and so there's a scale thing with yeah. the brush brushes too size that I'm working like over life size that I'm working at. Are you that always working over life size? I wasn't aware of that. Um, yeah, life size are larger, except for this one we were just talking about with the big circle of women, they couldn't be life size. That painting would be enormous. Be enormous. Yeah. yeah. So I actually, actually, personally, I actually don't like this painting as much because I think it's because the, the figures are like half life size and I just don't like working that size. I like to work, um, larger than life, preferably. Yeah, now that makes sense because you've got this portrait right here, Deborah. That's twenty by thirty. That's so my her mom. head is at least. Oh, that's your mom. That's awesome. So her head's at <laughs> at least fifteen inches, maybe, or not, yeah. maybe not twelve inches. That's a pretty big head. Definitely larger than life. Yeah. 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 Then okay. I can really get into the texture. You know, the texture of skin. I mean, you work. Life -size. I work life size. I don't go bigger than life very often. Yeah. But I mean, even life size allows you, I think, to really get into your skin whereas if it goes smaller it's you're describing the form but you can't describe the skin and yeah. me and you would love painting skin i, yeah, I, I, see I hate happening. painting smaller than life uh yeah, yeah for just, the exact same just, reason yeah exactly in yeah. fact i have my process is very similar to yours as you're describing the process is the same except i don't do the couching with the the colored glazes in between oh, oh i like couching i haven't heard that that's cool yeah well i think <laughs> that's the right term for it um i have no idea what i do honestly i don't I'm not very technical. Well, <laughs> I'm not either. I've heard that from other artists. I mean, I don't even do it, but it, yeah. But anyway, the colored glaze in between layers, I don't do that, but I do do a clear glaze so that I feel like it's wet into wet yeah. like you do. Um, but, you know, I've been working on, I've been painting for 20 years now, and I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Like I don't, like every day, every time I approach the canvas, I have to relearn how to paint. But it yeah. seems like you've got a very clear path in how you approach painting. Is that true? Or do you ever feel the way I just described? Oh, I feel the way you describe every day, even though, I've, even though I have a clear path, I still feel like that. It's like, there's still just the act of putting paint onto a surface and making it work. Like, it's still like, wait, how? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, well, and I I teach like uh, very occasionally, but I'll teach like a five day workshop, and I, I teach this process, and you know, like yes, I'm able to describe it and teach it, but so much is really just about the the act and the relationship of of the person with their brush and their materials and their surface. Like, there's so much there that's a complete mystery and unknown that you bring a lot of yourself to it, and there's days when I'm just like, yeah, I've I, I know that I know how to paint, but this is just not working. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that I just need to trust, like, right, it's just the painting is in the awkward teenage stage. They all go through that where they're just like, they're not this cute new painting anymore. And they're definitely not a mature finished painting. They're an awkward teenager. And they're, I have to accept that and not judge them for it and just push on through. And then that, I mean, I just have to trust. So I trust the process. I just have learned to like trust that I'm, that it's going to feel and look not very good. Hmm. And the more I do, the more I just I'm like, yep, this is part of it. So I, I don't get too bogged down by the fact that I feel like I've forgotten how to paint so often. 
it's yeah. just um it's just part of it it's the mystery of it i mean if you if you felt super confident all the time like it would be kind of boring and um it'd be it nice be challenging though. it'd be nice though to feel yes. confident all the time yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you've uh said it exactly the way i i i would say it um in that well for me i've told students before when it's in that ugly as you put it the teenage stage i'm like i've said to them well i've I've had, I've seen this stage so much. It's like at this point, I just, and I, and I've gotten through it enough that even though I'm really stressed out right now, I know I'll eventually get through it. Exactly. <laughs> but just, the stress is still there. Just, totally. I mean, it's yeah. just like getting comfortable with discomfort. I mean, right. and trusting time and process. Yeah. So I'm looking at your mom here. How does your mom feel about your success? Oh, she's very proud and supportive and and um yeah i think she's quite happy about it it's it's sweet she when people you know will go up to her and be like oh you must be so proud of your daughter she she always says well she worked really hard she worked really hard which i appreciate that my mom sees how hard that i work um yeah. and she you know she she understands because she's an artist as well we've we've gone different paths because um you know she was in New York and grew up there and, and left New York. And I chose to go back there and made a career there. So we've had different career paths, but um, my new work is like much more related to the type of work she does. So I, 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 uh, I think we're like, I'm understanding her and her work a lot more now that I make my work differently. Cause she works very completely intuitively, um, figurative often, but like completely intuitively and from her imagination, she wouldn't say imagination though, but intuition. And um, that's how I'm working now. So I feel like we actually are coming more close and we get each other more now. I get her more now um, than I did, but yeah, it's, it's great to have an artist mom. We can, you know, go to museums and talk art and yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, I bet. So I, well, I'm curious about how you became so passionate about realism when your mother wasn't particularly passionate about realism when you were a child. How did you go down that road? Probably because she wasn't, you know, I think it was like, I want to make my own way. Mm. Um, you know, like kids, we, we kind of find out who we are by separating from our parents a, a bit. And, um, I think that's part of it. I mean, I was obsessed with realism. Like this is embarrassing, but I, my mom, amazing mom would take me to museums. She took me to Picasso show probably at the Met when I was a kid. Cause we'd go visit her parents and our fam her family in New York every year. And I was so lucky to get to do that. And, um, I, uh, she's told me, and I don't really remember this, but I just turned my back on Picasso. Based on <laughs> my last statement about Picasso, you know, I'm not going to judge you for it. <laughs> um, but I was just so angry. Like there was just to me such a magic in like Rembrandt who was yeah. in the other, it's like, why is Picasso getting this recognition and Rembrandt? Uh, well, Rembrandt was too, but, um, you know, I was just obsessed with this kind of realism because it was just, it was magic. It was magical. And that's the only way I can describe it. It was magic. And, and also, you know, it was different from what my mom did. And I really wanted to separate myself and be my own person. And as much as I admire her and, um, yeah. And, and now I actually totally respect Picasso. I might not like all his paintings, but I totally respect him and, and get it. I get it now, which is like a bit disconcerting to go from one extreme to the other, but, uh, <laughs> I just have to go with, Go with the flow, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to explain it to me when we're done with the podcast. I'm still not convinced. <laughs> oh, I, I still don't know if I fully understand, but um, <laughs> I, but for me, it's never about understanding intellectually. It's right. about like how you feel. Like right. I, I feel something when I look at that now, and yeah. before I, I, I felt something. I just felt like anger, which was probably <laughs> hey, they say yeah, modernists say that's a good feeling in art. So yeah, um, yeah. Well, so. Speaking of modernism, I'm back on your your new work. Do you think you'll ever completely abandon realism? Do you think that's even a possibility? I mean, everything is a possibility, but um, I don't know what would make me do that because I I 
it's such a core of who I am that I would feel like I was totally abandoning myself if I did. But knowing how much I've changed, who knows? But that's not at all my intention. Right. Um, for me, finding a language that is just that. Um, sorry, we're going to pause really quick. Can you hear that music? Nope. Is it loud? I can't okay, hear anything. Great. Yeah. There's um, there's some wonderful homeless people who are right outside my studio often and they play music. So um, <laughs> no, I can't hear it. It was, it was too loud. Good. Um, so for me, finding this language that can describe my experience of living in the world includes realism and intuitive abstraction. I don't, it's not totally abstract, but it includes these two things. So the way that I see that is like the realism to me is, is um, kind of speaks to the solidity of the world that we can see mm -hmm. and uh, the solidity of the world that I can understand intellectually with my mind. But my experience of being alive as I get older uh, is that there's much more to the world than that. There's a lot more to the world than what I can just see and what I can understand. And so this other work to me speaks speaks to those things that I can't intellectually understand. It speaks to my body. Um, it speaks to kind of my nervous system. Um, Francis Bacon has this amazing quote that, um, see if I can remember it exactly, but um, he said, I'm trying to paint as accurately off my nervous system as I can. And I think that that's kind of what I'm trying to do now mm -hmm. is paint from the system versus my mind. And so these, the, the, the combining of realism and more of a loose intuitive abstraction to me describes that and, and, and kind of not just, I guess it describes that, but it, it not just describes it. Um, it kind of embodies that feeling and, and makes it visual, which is what I, you know, I'm a visual person trying to put things into visual form and, and these speak to that. So if I was going to, if I was going to try to paint these paintings here purely realistically, they wouldn't actually portray what I'm trying to portray. They wouldn't portray a feeling so much. They would be more of a description. And, um, but I feel like I need both. I really need both. Like if, because because they both are part of my experience of what it is to be alive. Like I I feel in a physical body. I'm in my I'm in my body. I can see the world. I I love the physical world, and as I said, as I get older, I just know that there's so much more to the world that we can see. And so how can I portray that through paint and mm -hmm. still have it be visual? Mm -hmm. See it, but portray that in a way that your body kind of feels it. Like you get a you get a like hit on your body. Maybe not everyone, but you know like. Um, kind of hits you in a, in a different way. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. I think I know so. I'm I think it does. Yeah. But you know, a uh, thought that has come to mind throughout our conversation is you've said several times that you feel like your identity is wrapped up in realism it, and it has been since you were a child. And then you described your process, uh, previous to 2020, 2021 as being as like a, or maybe I described it this way, but you agreed as being kind of a documentarian and, yeah. and looking, and you said looking outward and, yeah. and recording what you're seeing outside of yourself. And now your new work is sort of uh, going from the inside out and doing what's inward. So to me, the inward sounds more like your personal identity. Right. And yet, yeah. and yet you see yourself intellectually as a realist. So there's well, almost not, a, any, not, not that's really, and that's really interesting. I don't anymore because, because I'm doing this kind of work now. Okay. So I've had, so you don't have that I've, identity anymore. Now you, you, you've sort of escaped that identity that you've been carrying since your child. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm breaking out of that identity and I've, it's felt incredible to, to break out of that identity. Um, because it didn't necessarily feel like an, an identity that I discovered on my own. Mm. Um, it felt like one that I was told because I have direct memories of being in like preschool and kindergarten with friends, friends saying, Aliyah, draw something for us. You're so good at drawing. Um, and so it became my identity. It be, because, oh, you know, yeah. we all want to be told what we're good at. We all want to, you know, I really like I'm a people pleaser. I really wanted to like please people around me. And so I sort of built up this identity of like, oh, people like me if I do this. And 
it's not that I didn't like doing it. I did, but I think a lot of it was that I, I uh, was told that I was good at it and that feels good. And so I built up this identity that wasn't maybe actually totally accurate to me. And so over the last couple of years, realizing and really discovering and then breaking out of that to discover really what is my own identity, like what is my own shape if I'm looking more inward. And I think that's why COVID was helpful for me because everything broke apart. All these external boundaries broke apart. We were alone. We had to change everything. And so we all looked a bit more inward, I think. And for me, it was an incredible chance to look inward and realize, oh, I'm maybe I'm actually someone really different than I always thought that I was. And I think that's just part of growing older. We all kind of go through these layers of discovering who we are more. But I know that I, me as a person, I've thought of myself very much as um, sort of from the outside in, like I've thought of myself in the past as um, kind of being shaped by what other people thought of me. Mm. Um, I wasn't aware of that at the time because I wasn't aware. That's the thing. Like I wasn't aware of my inner place because I was just thinking so much about like, do other people like me? Getting super personal therapy mm. here. Um, <laughs> it's so called the undraped artist. So you're getting exactly. mostly undraped for me here. <laughs> so like now and over the past couple of years, my just own personal work has been creating my own shape from my inside. Like, who am I if I'm thinking of myself from my center versus the external shapes around me? Um, and so part of that was breaking the shell that I had built my whole identity on. I had to break that shell. And it's not that that shell is completely unnecessary, like, I, or not me at all. Like, realism is absolutely part of me. Like, I have loved it since before anyone told me I was good at it. But I am way more than just that. And so these paintings are me trying to find a language that can describe maybe not describe, I don't think I like the word describe, that can like embody um, and become out in the world an external representation of who I feel I am on the inside. Yeah, that's, yeah. I, I'm really glad, glad you shared that. To me, it almost sounds like, and I think probably most of us, if not all of us, go through a similar thing, but it's like when you were young, all of your friends, family, whoever, Worse, you were you might have been red, yellow, and blue, but everyone was noticing your blue. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. you were like, "Oh, well, then let me work on the blue. Oh, that's that's my thing because that's what everyone notices." And it's only now that the yellow and red's coming out. Exactly. Yeah. yeah that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah and that's... it's you know it's a hard process. It's a challenging process to like look at yourself that way because sometimes you see things you don't you know, you don't love, but you know, sometimes you th see things that aren't stereotypically beautiful. And that's, I think why, when I was making these paintings, I really wanted to embrace that sort of awkwardness. Like I would use my non-dominant hand. I was trying to make them ugly. I was trying to make them bad, you know, because I wanted to like embrace, like, what if it's not perfect? You mm -hmm. know, I've definitely been a perfectionist my whole life. Like, what if it isn't my idea of perfect? What if perfect actually is something else? Um, what if there's a perfection in mm -hmm. awkwardness and discomfort? And um, there totally is. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful and and so exciting to me to to find to find that. And it's um, really hard to put into words. Yeah. Well, <laughs> to me, when I'm looking at these paintings, it's almost like you've discovered the perfection in nature in a more abs well abstract's probably the wrong word. Um, in a conceptual way, I don't, I'm not sure the right word, but you know, how you walk yeah. into the woods and it's all this chaos, just leaves all different colors and just, you know, every, it's just absolute chaos. And somehow there's beauty in the chaos because of the harmony in the chaos. And so, yeah. and in your work, yeah, technically it's not like the, it's not like when you're drawing with your less dominant hand, you're technically genius, right? <laughs> <laughs> No. But what you've done is you've done sort of what nature does. You've found the harmony and you've created perfection in the imperfection, as you put it. Yeah. At least I yeah, see it as that way. It's just so beautiful yeah. that the the, the uh, in unpredictability, the chaos, the... But yet you somehow organize that into this harmonious 
set of shapes and colors and forms and textures. Yeah. It's so much fun. I have to say it is so much fun because when I'm in the studio, I'm actually having to make these like creative decisions that aren't based off of anything. Whereas in the past, it's like making creative decisions based off of like, well, does this look real? You know, yeah. which I, you know, and you're like, bound, challenged. you're like stuck in that cage almost, yeah. right? Well, it could be a cage for me. It had become a cage, but it yeah. also doesn't, it can be a horizon. It for, can be. And it was a, a long time. And it, I think is that for, for pure realists, totally respect and love that. But for me, it became a bit of a cage. And so like now getting to be in the studio and make decisions based off of just sitting there and being like, does that brush mark feel right? Does that Completely non-objectively. It's just all feeling. There's no bound. There's no rules. Boundaries, no rules. And that's scary. It's so scary to, to be like, there are no rules and no boundaries. So, oh my God, what if this is terrible? You know, what if I have and that I had a lot of a lot of that those fears in the beginning like i have no idea what i'm doing like i have confidence in realism i don't have confidence in this kind of painting you know everyone thinks it's just so easy but like it's not to to try to get a brush mark that feels just the right balance of awkward and elegant and that's it, just describe I mean, there are no rule it, it there's no rules um and yet there is there is a rightness, there's a wholeness that I will hit upon and the, and it's, but it's, it's kind of like I'm swimming in the dark or, or, or walking in the dark. It's like, I'm, I don't really know what I'm looking for until I see it. And, and that's why it's so much fun. Cause it's just like a constant discovery and, um, accidents in a much bigger scale will happen. And then I'll be like, oops, I didn't mean to do that, but wow, that's really cool. Now that's going to lead me in this whole other direction in this painting that I didn't think it would go. And um, really just trying to kind of walk into, you know, paint, but walk in the creative path in, in, in one where I'm not, it's not planned. Like I don't, it's really not as planned. I'm planning a little bit, but much less, much less the new work is even less than the work we're seeing right now on the website, um, less planned. And it's oh, man, really I'm challenging dying to see that. I can't wait. I can't um, wait. Thank you. I'm excited to, to share it when, when it's time. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm, I'm, I'm like discovering creativity in a way that I hadn't felt since I was a kid, I think. Um, not to say I didn't have fun painting before I did, but it was a different, it was a totally different kind of thing. And this is, entirely new and really rewarding. You know, I, I've had a couple thoughts again while you're talking. So one analogy that I've often um, given my students, you know, who are trying to find themselves and, or m more people who are deciding what they want to do with their career and what they want to do with their education particularly, is I've given the analogy of a poet that has a, like a 200 word vocabulary. I mean, how much can a poet with a 200 word vocabulary actually say? And at some point they have to just learn a language so that they have yeah. the vocabulary to actually be expressive. Right. And yeah. when I look at these paintings, you clearly have a huge vocabulary. And that's the reason to me, they're different than other abstract work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying other abstract work isn't good. There's a lot of great abstract work, but there's something about yours that the high vocabulary that you have in this, these paintings, you've got, because you're not just completely letting go. No. Like you're not because, you know, another thing that I've, I've always defined art as good craftsmanship, good design and a good idea, right? And a lot of abstract work abandons either craftsmanship or an idea. And, and yeah. you've still got, you've still got some really, really nice craftsmanship in here. And your concepts, whether they be design oriented or other or color concepts or whatever, they're, it's, it feels strong conceptually. Um, I mean, so anyway, not yeah, to keep on, uh, keep on just pounding you with compliments, but <laughs> I do appreciate it for the new work, especially, especially coming from, from you. I was actually a little nervous to get on your podcast. Cause I was like, oh, he's such a realist. Like. What is he going to think about this new work? I'm, I was surprised that you asked me, actually. Oh, really? No. See, honestly, I mean, my older work, you're probably not familiar with, but I did the reverse of what you did. So oh, I used to combine okay. abstract and realism back early in my career. 
And then oh, at wow. some point I took a two and a half year sabbatical and I went completely classical. And then, so I used to, I mean, I was nowhere near as good as you are when I was doing abstract and realism together. And it was completely different, but I've always had a huge, I mean, I'm super drawn to this concept of bringing realism and abstract together. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, at some point I, I did the opposite. I'm like, I need to really flesh out realism. But totally. um, I've actually been sort of craving going back in that direction again. Um, I'm not sure well, how, what that'll look like. Yeah. Yeah. You won't know until you do it. I, I mean, know. I think that's, it's, it's just so interesting to see like how artists change. Um, I know Vincent Desiderio was an abstract painter first, and then he became a realist painter. And I always found that fascinating and probably the reason why he's so good. Yeah. He does. Yeah. I didn't know that either. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. who knows, but no, I, I, you're one of my favorite painters and I'm, I'm really grateful to have you on the, on the podcast. Thank you. So, so much. I got one more question for you and then I'll let you go. I think we're well over two hours probably. So I apologize for taking all your time, but I always <laughs> ask everyone this, um, as a successful painter, what advice would you give those who are aspiring to become painters? Mm. Good question. Um, I, I think I would, I would give the advice that you should listen to all advice. <laughs> Okay, that's but, good. But notice what resonates with you. Notice how you feel when you listen to the advice. Um, there's some advice that, that you're going to hear and you're going to be like, no, no, nope, not for me. And trust that. Don't just think that the person who's telling you because they're, um, you know, more further along in their career or they're a teacher or whatever is, is right. Like art is such a personal thing that I think you need to you need to you need to stay true to who you are and essentially take so what i mean by like take all the advice notice how it feels in your body in yourself however however you process information and and notice what resonates and take that and let go of everything else just let it go so yeah take 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 everything and only only what resonates for you that's great advice that's great it helps it helped me because otherwise um, you will get over, like I got overwhelmed. Like people are saying so many different things. I don't know who I am, what, it, what, I don't know what to do. Now I'm hearing all these different things and I don't know what to do. And if you don't have a strong sense of who you are and you only build that up through uh, sensing into yourself every time you get feedback, um, if you don't build that, that core, like you won't make it out in the world because the world is, um, full of opinions and you need to know what you can take you really do need to stay open absolutely but also like what you should just let go of um and it really it really helps me and still does help me as i'm changing my work and um i still something i will never let go of so so that's my that's my piece of advice that's perfect i appreciate that hey Leah, it was so great talking to you i'm like i said i'm seriously starstruck having you on the podcast it's uh it's amazing to talk to you and thank you very much for taking the time thank you so much jeff this has been such a fascinating conversation one of the best and thank you for uh really diving into all the work and seeing the connections of it and appreciating the new stuff again thank you so much uh this is this has been really really wonderful for me thank you thanks for tuning in to the undraped artist podcast if you enjoyed it subscribe and if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.